I am here with John O, Jonathan Leaf, and I'm excited to talk about all things. Well, I was going to say math, but Jonathan refers to himself as a comprehensionist. Did I say that right? Yeah, comprehensivist. What is that? This is how Buckminster Fuller described himself, because people are always asking me, you know, are you a mathematician? Are you an architect? Are you a philosopher? You know, a logician? And he would say, I'm a comprehensivist. So I said, that works. Comprehensive. So you've got a comprehensive perspective on many different aspects. Yeah. Yeah. Fuller was sort of like this favorite reading of mine between the years of 1986 and 1992, after I met him at Future World Expo 83, which was his last public appearance. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, he, he died uh, a short time afterward. And I was born in 82. Do you remember what his was? Did he have a concept of the, the world in the future? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think he referred to it as Spaceship Earth. And I didn't actually read his more popular kind of stuff. I read his scientific works called Synergetics, Volumes 1 and 2, uh, that had the subtitle, Explorations in the Geometry of Thinking. And so it was all about how to discipline the mind, you know, to appreciate how geometry is a language that infiltrates every aspect of the cosmos, you know, philosophically, logically, you know, because, you know, you have these principles of triangulation so that, you know, trigonometry is something that you can use to be philosophical with and to to leverage certain ideas, you know, then you've got, you know, the philosophy of, you know, Marx and Lenin and all that dialectical stuff, you know, um, what was it called? Uh, thesis, antithesis and synthesis, right? And then there's hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, number and, and logic goes together. I remember this fellow, Stan Tenen, who died about a year ago, uh, said, if something happens once, it's an anomaly. If two anomalies intersect, they generate a coincidence. And when three, you know, anomalies triangulate, you get a pattern. And so, you know, there are ways of quantifying or qualifying, you know, number in terms of how it works at a qualitative level. Because, for example, in, you know, with gravity, you know, where would gravity be without triangulation? You know, all, all the finest logic dealing with gravity is all about causal dynamical triangulation. So that's one of the big buzzwords in the field. All right. You mentioned some stuff that I'm excited to get into. You mentioned geometry. You mentioned numbers. You mentioned gravity, which I'm assuming has some sort of relationship to space and time. And these are all interesting topics. It's my intention with this show that somebody out there hears your message, hears your story, and we're able to get John O on to more shows so he can spread his wisdom to many more people and hopefully get on a show that with somebody who knows a little bit more about these concepts than I do because I'm going to be doing my best to keep up but I know there's other people out there that are are 10 times more knowledgeable about this information that can get into some really interesting conversations so if you guys know anybody definitely push this show over to the people that can get this message out. Gravity. Gravity is obviously one of the great subjects, right? Yes. Yeah. The, the, uh, so the way that I was taught, and I, I don't believe most people were taught about gravity, is that it's associated with mass, and that the more mass something has, the more gravity it has, which is a magnetic force that pulls other mass objects into it. And the more I looked into physics on the surface, I, I barely understand any of this, but it seems like that might not be the case. What's your interpretation of how gravity works and, and what it is? Well, I can always point to, you know, the shoulders that I would be standing on, you know, in terms of appreciating, you know, very succinct descriptions that really, you know, hit the nail on the head. Uh, Walter Russell said something to the effect that uh, gravity is the conversion of the simultaneous into the sequential, which is also how time is produced, because you don't get time without causal relations and without sequence. And when you're dealing with light, 
which is sequenceless, you know, because it's massless, that's where you have this notion of simultaneity. Got it. So, you know, there, there are issues with, you know, trying to decide which force is more primordial, gravity or electromagnetism. And I'm of the opinion that electromagnetism came first, just in the sense of let there be light, because, you know, you start with the masslessness of simultaneity, and then you have to produce the time continuum, which requires sequence. And in, in my philosophy, this actually involves the conversion of a palindrome, which reads in the same direction forwards as backwards, into more complex forms of sequence. But palindromic language is very, very special uh, in that it has these reversibilities. And yeah, I would just stick with this idea that gravity is the conversion of the simultaneous into the sequential. And, you know, you could say that numerically, when you're dealing with the number nine, whose reciprocal is one ninth, which converted to a decimal extension or decimal expansion is 0 0.11111111. This is where you begin this palindromic phase mm. because there are all these partitions of that 11111 that goes on forever, you know, into shorter, briefer periods of one, like 11 times 11 gives you 121, which is still a palindrome, you know, or 11 to the third power is 1331, 11 to the fourth power is 14641. And so it, it is tied to the DNA because the DNA is also based on palindromic language. And, you know, they use these markers with the CRISPR, you know, technology, whose acronym PR, who, whose the last two letters, you know, are, are PR, stands for palindromic repeats. But yeah, palindromicity is, is very, very special. And you know, there are these mainstream traditions in math that don't look at the sort of underground forms of math that are trying to make their way, you know, into the mainstream. So until a lot of this stuff is found useful in laboratories, then no one pays attention to it. So cycles, I'm hearing, I'm hearing cycles and I'm hearing that these, well, you're calling them palindromes, but they're repeating and, or they, they may repeat, but there are sequences of cycles in numbers that are permeating the entire universe. Yeah. And light is existing simultaneously, which means not constricted by time, right? Yes. And then you're saying that gravity is the, I don't know if you said force, but gravity is the aspect that brings the simultaneous light into a sequential phase which is absolutely. what we call past, present, and future. Yes, Ab absolutely. That, that was well said. So gravity is the, is it a force? Is it? Well, I mean, some people would say that it's a force. I mean, you know, whenever you look for creative metaphors, you know, that really explain things, uh, you know, when you align with gravity, everything falls into place, mm. right? Because Einstein had his thing about, you know, acceleration and, you know, things falling and that being the same thing as a gravitational field. But, uh, you know, when you think about trying to align with nature, you know, uh, looking at gravity as the way in which everything falls into place or gives everything its rightful place is pretty special. So you mentioned prime reciprocal, which is, uh, which I'll let you explain just in layman's terms, what, a. uh, prime reciprocal is it's it's a match of some sort to a prime number why don't we start with the prime number just okay what a prime number is and then what's a prime reciprocal and why is that special why is okay. that a prime number is a number that's only divisible by one and itself so it's not vulnerable it's very stubborn you know and and forceful and, and steadfast in the way that it you know executes its will or willpower uh as opposed to a number that is divisible by many other numbers, like you take the number six, which is divisible by one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. So it's obviously not prime. But these, these qualities of divisibility, for example, with one, two, and three dividing into six, are present in prime reciprocals. 
Now, why are prime reciprocals special? Because they've been known to sort of inhabit a class of math known as recreational math, you know, where you're just looking at how numbers play, but they're really pretty serious. Recreational. And so, yeah, so if you look up recreational math in prime numbers or prime reciprocals, you'll see, you know, thousands of hits because it's a subject that's been written about on and off, you know, for, uh, for, for centuries. Uh, what was called the MIDI property, M-I-D-Y, which is sort of like, you know, the more formal secrets behind prime reciprocals that was discovered in France in 1836 by this fellow Midi. And, and that's what drives the beauty of prime reciprocals. So the way I look at a prime reciprocal is that because it's one divided by a prime, mm -hmm. right, you're basically combining the undivided nature of the one, which is singular, with uh, the denominator, which is prime, but which is plural and indivisible. So you bring the indivisible and the undivided together in this very creative way. And the prime, in its stubbornness, has no other choice but to spill its guts out and to reveal every aspect of its anatomy in the face of oneness. And so you could say that because frequency, as in waveforms, right, are just fractionations of unity, Mm -hmm. that prime reciprocals are going to get give you the absolutely purest view of the archetype of frequency. It's essentially the frequency of the prime number. It takes like so se so one divided by seven. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm not a calculator like you. Yeah, yeah. One, <laughs> one divided by seven is is a famous number that was studied by this mystic named Gurdjieff. Mm -hmm. uh, but one divided by seven is one, four, two, eight, five, seven. And the first thing you notice about what I was just speaking in regard to the MIDI property is that one, four, two, plus eight, five, seven give you nine, nine, nine. Wow. And so this is how all full period primes are designed. So if you were to look at the number, you know, one seventeenth, for example, it's another full period prime that's going to go to 16 decimal places. And it's going to have this MIDI property pairing of 8 plus 8 digits. So when you divide 70, 17 into 1, it's going to go 0, 5, 8, 8, 2, 3, 5, 2. Those are the first 8. And then it's going to be followed by 9, 4, 1, 1, 7, 6, 4, 7. So when you add those two together, then you get 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, you know, to 8 decimal places. And this is how the symmetry of primes are, uh, are sort of laid out or vulnerable to analysis. Because when you build from one prime reciprocal to another, right, if you go from 17 to 19, there's no way of really generally quantifying, you know, 17-ness versus 19-ness in traditional prime terms because nobody really knows how or why primes are distributed in the way that they are, right? Uh, there are classes of primes called twin primes, so that if two primes like 17 and 19 are only separated by two digits, then they're twins. But when you look at the reciprocals of 1 17th and 1 19th, all of the digits that are in 1 17th are in 1 19th with the addition of two more. So 1 19th will have all the digits that 1 17th has with the addition of three and six. And so this is a way of codifying prime numbers on, on a new level that has this idealized type of frequency that drives it, you know, in terms of integer frequencies, threes and sixes, right, nines and zeros, and then the one, four, two, eight, five, seven, or one, four, seven, eight, five, two, in which case those, those, those pairs of three, one, four, seven, are separated by threenesses, right, one, four, and then seven, and eight five two is is you know a declension, but uh, yeah, it, it's quite fascinating because it, it drives all of logic and it simply hasn't found its use in a laboratory yet. But it seems like there's a definite relationship between the prime reciprocals. I find it interesting that you mentioned, and it, could you clarify this? You said that nobody really knows why prime numbers are laid out in like 
base 10 num like the base 10 system are you saying that we don't know the pattern that they're laid out like we can't make sense of the pattern yeah yeah they're they're noisy you know they they have properties that are very difficult to predict hmm. and you know at the very very high level of math uh, then you've got you know this thing that's that's known as the Riemann zeta uh, you know functions that have to do with all of the base systems you know operating together you know that are aligned through a zero logical principle so so zero plays a very large role in understanding primes i remember one time leaving a message on this guy's phone machine. His name was uh, Andrew Odlisko, Ad who was a famous mathematician from AT&T who studies primes, who held the record for calculating, you know, Ryman's zeros, you know, more accurately than anybody else. And I left him a message on his voicemail uh, about looking into prime reciprocals and just, you know, gave him a, a few little specifics that I thought were key insights. And m mind you, you know, I'm a nobody on the map. You know, this is like 25 years ago. He actually called me back from an airport in Poland like three hours later. He said, is Jonathan there? <laughs> <laughs> and that was my, my, my brush with prime greatness, you know, back then. But, you know, it, it's hard to, you know, to get long-term dedicated scientist, you know, perspectives to want to wanna shift gears or look at new methods of ca calibration. It's very difficult. And how does how is this applicable to life or business or government? Because there's obviously mathematics is a big part of how everything's put together. And for myself personally, when I think about math, I think how it's useful in engineering or how to build a spaceship. But is there other uses beyond sort of just measurement and G and and how to engineer stuff what what other uses are there well i mean you know in spiritual you know physical type practices uh you know you can be instructed to do things a certain number of times mm -hmm. you know yes. like like if you're doing some agni sara you know type yoga you know yoga and and you need to do some some breath thing you know with your stomach or whatever right. you know 80, 81 times or, yeah. or, or whatever number uh i mean there are rhythms that entrain systems that are ways of giving yourself discipline and precision uh, so that maybe you're always on time, you know. Uh, precision is helpful, and, you know, numbers are kind of the epitome of precision. When I think of numbers, I also think about the matrix, you know, like the, the computer screen with all the numbers going, and that's how yeah. reality fits together. I love it. What's your perspective on the matrix theory? Well, it's very Pythagorean in the sense that, you know, all is number. That was one of, you know, the supposed quotes of Pythagoras. Uh, and even though there's a conflict between what would be called deterministic principles, you know, where things are predetermined and, you know, quantum uncertainty, I think there's a wedding between mm -hmm. the two to be had. And there, there's no question that we live in a matrix. I mean, that's one that's I mean, waking up to that is almost like the first day of puberty for a new form of childhood, you know, recognizing that. And I'm, I'm very pleased with all of the holographic paradigms that have, you know, taken over the high end of physics to try to explain the special effects lab that, you know, where all these special effects in, you know, the matrix go on, mm -hmm. you know, the, the spinners or, or the, the strange behaviors of fermions that have one half spin so that they have to rotate 720 degrees in order to come full circle. And, and this was something that was explored and, you know, brought down to a popular level of explanation by Paul Dirac, who, interestingly enough, was born on 8-8, because the 8 has this kind of similar property of 720 degrees, you know, where, where you know, in Dirac's famous string trick uh you know he you know he asks you to rotate your hand you know through through space and this is the way that you you know do a 720 degree rotation which which characterizes one half spin 
But anyway, yeah, it's a special effects lab, and we're just figuring these things out. And it, it's, yeah, it, it's a fabulous adventure to use numbers in ways of, uh, of harnessing or understanding determinism within the quantum field. Numbers are where the deterministic reality or the and the the uncertain reality can can meet it, yeah it's finding the num it's finding it in the numbers yeah see the Greeks were very 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 mechanistic with regard to number and until like the last century or whatever nobody even knew quite how much the Greeks were into mechanistic number because the Antikythera mechanism at that point had not been found. And the Antikythera mechanism was found in a Greek shipwreck that took, it was all crusted over. I mean, today it's considered, you know, mankind's first computer. But basically the Greeks had studied, you know, celestial patterns for hundreds of years, you know, writ, wrote them down and then designed a set of gears so that the numbers of gears, you know, would interlock in a certain way and you could replicate the whole, you know, orbital system of the solar system in, in a little box this big, you know, that like you would crank this handle and the things would turn. And it was all because of the, the exact sets, you know, of, of gears that were interlocking that gave this perfect, you know, rendition of the solar system. So it took three generations of scholars to actually decrypt the Antikythera mechanism, which is quite famous. And it, it makes for an interesting story because that's how I got turned on to YouTube, hmm. you know, initially. Was that because it, it provides, you know, an ongoing source of interesting story material and teachings to you long, long after you've fallen asleep. <laughs> it woke me up in the middle of the night, you know, the Antikythera mechanism. I was like listening to a documentary. And it's quite fascinating because the central gear of the Antikythera mechanism has 64 teeth. And, I mean, that's the number of codons right. you know, for, for the DNA. So it's like when you look at where 64 comes up in nature, well, I mean, you've got the I Ching, right? Right. And, and so it's kind of an interesting crossover. I don't know that anybody's ever written about the potential connection between Antikythera and the I Ching or the DNA or, or any of that. But, you know, I'm sure there are experts just on the number 64, a lot of that comes up in human design and and yeah the codons and and how it relates to the type of person that you are based on the time and place that you were born and then that's based on the uh neutrinos the the, the atmosphere of neutrinos during that time mm. and place so I've seen it in places. Um, you, this anti kithra Yes. Is that, like, how does, how were they using that? Were they predicting wars? The, the, what were the, they the predicting? The history of it is very interesting because they thought initially, and I think it was later disproven, but they thought initially that it was actually the work of Archimedes. Mm -hmm. Archimedes had built this box. And there may be still a certain set of scholars that believe this. But, uh, yeah, it, it's fascinating. I mean, we're talking about ancient wisdom. And we're talking about the fact that every new generation of scholars tends to think that now is the best time to know everything. You know, not knowing how much has been forgotten. Or that wisdom is perpetually, continually degrading. It's being lost every day. You know, like species of animals that go extinct. And then, you know, only these animals don't get rediscovered, you know, uh, a thousand years later. Um, and, right. And, you know, but yeah, wisdom goes extinct. I mean, it's born and it goes extinct. And this is the case with the nineness of the Enneagram, or what the Greeks called the Ennead, which is not unrelated to the Pythagorean, uh, Pythagorean Tetractus. You know, nineness and tenness. Uh, they they were on to understanding fundamental principles, and you know when you translate, for example, the magic square of China, the Lo Shu magic square, which is a three by three matrix into more of a, a tetractian format, 
then things really get interesting. So you, you mentioned the Greeks, you're mentioning numbers, nineness. When I think about Greeks, I think about oracles. And then you just mentioned Magic Square, which if you guys go to Jonathan Weef's website, numbersmicroscope.com, you'll see, are those magic squares on there? I, I see a bunch of geometry, but I see squares, and it looks like magic square type. Yeah, the, the, the truth is, I don't have a clear picture of, of all the images that are on the, the first page of the site. I mean, there, there's some cool stuff. I mean, it's all in this 250-page book that I wrote. It took me, like, literally 70,000 hours over 30 years to write, you know. This one? Yeah. And the book's called Numbers Microscope. Yeah. And, and I got that idea from an article that was written by a guy named Joel Cohen called Mathematics is Biology's Next Microscope, Only Better. And it's just a way of, like, you know, thinking about number as a way of actually approaching things that cannot yet be seen in the lab, you know, but to understand the structure of things prior to having the hardware, which is not unlike the way particle physics goes about you know, uh, predicting things and then finding them. You know, in the case of Higgs, it took 50 years, you know, between when it was predicted. Not that they knew the mass range that the Higgs existed at that time because it took the discovery of the W and the Z boson in the early 80s before they realized, you know, wh where Higgs might be in that mix. And then, of course, Ashe Darwadker, who's an algebraic topologist, predicted the Higgs mass based on its relationship to the W and the Z boson, exactly like five years before they found it. So numbers, math, geometry, this, this is, quote, I was going to say seen, but this is perceived before we see it. And in the case of Higgs, it was 50 years. There yeah. is a perception of this formation, and then 50 years of technology and understanding, and then they actually see it or they yeah. actually can perform a test and demonstrate it. Yeah. And so numbers are the microscope that that can see through dimensions. It can see beyond what we're able to witness. Yeah. Now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it's all about what gets proven useful in a laboratory because these guys, you know, would be dropping their jaws, you know, and redesigning particle collision detectors if they knew that this type of number system existed. And the fact that the new generation of particle detectors is probably going to involve DNA is very, very interesting because, you know, as soon as you've got particle beams, you know, interacting with, you know, DNA, it gets to be very much like star systems, you know, in terms of neutrino output of, of stars and then, you know, the planetary life that, that gathers around a star system because, you never have a planet without a star, you know. The star comes first, and then the planets come later. And, and it's all about the quest for water that, that generates life, because the DNA is, is just this abstract, you know, more or less helpless language in the absence of water, or in the absence of the water principle, because hydrogen is the first element, and oxygen is the eighth. And you do see this rational hierarchy of number expressing through the periodic table. So, I mean, you can look at number in terms of whole rational integers and say, well, what's going on here? And why is nitrogen the seventh element? And why is carbon the sixth? Wow. I mean, it, it's all there. Oxygen's, so hydrogen's the most abundant, according to my knowledge, hydrogen's the most abundant element in the universe. And oxygen is the third most abundant. And I find that interesting. I, I want to say that helium, which is two, is the second. So it goes one, two, and then it skips to eight. Yeah. I, I would say that, that there are some holes in my, my knowledge when it comes to astrophysics and stuff. I mean, I know that, that there's an evolution through the periodic table you know, where hydrogen becomes, you know, helium in terms of red giant phases and all that kind of stuff. And there is nucleosynthesis to these higher, you know, levels that involve iron. And it's kind of interesting when you look at a red giant or the, the red giant phase in terms of its relationship to iron, because 
that's hemoglobin. You know, it's blood. And, and there's no question that there are these biological themes that are at work within the star systems. There's no question about it. Right, and, and the elements are mass, right? Like, that is matter. And light, it's coming from a generator of light, which is, which is, which has no mass. And then you mentioned electromagnetism, like an electron, for example, has mass. So there's some sort of relationship or interaction that's happening that's transferring light into matter. It is very much like photosynthesis, very much. And I say that because with photosynthesis, you're splitting water, which is made up of a one and an eight, essentially. Uh, and you're splitting the water molecule into its hydrogen and oxygen components and then putting them to work to synthesize other stuff, you know, like glucose. But in the case of uh, the event horizon of a black hole, for example, light is what's being split, not water. So that this is the same type of principle, you know, in terms of a splitting that's going on that in the case of an event horizon is producing the time continuum because you don't have time until you split the photon into electron positron charges, right? Where the electron has a negative charge that's associated with the past. And so electrons are said to travel into the past as opposed to the positrons, the positive charges that are associated with the future. But that's, that's where it all begins. And I mean, this is what made Stephen Hawking famous. Yeah. You mentioned hydrogen at one, oxygen at eight. I added those two up. It equals nine. Yes. That water is extremely important. Um, and then you mentioned enneagram earlier. The, the, the enneagram is underground wisdom, you know, that, that hasn't found its role yet, even though it's been a part of history. And there was one Greek philosopher, I forget who it was, like maybe Nicomachus or something like that, who, who commented on the meaning of the, uh, the Ennead, which is the same thing as an Enneagram, more or less. But uh, I think he said something to the effect that all of the integers you know, are afloat in an ocean, in an Enneadic ocean, or that the Ennead was the ocean in which all the integers were, were floating which is kind of interesting in itself because when you look at the magic square, which was said to have been seen floating in a river, all, all these things are very fluid. And, and I love uh, one of the characteristic descriptions from the high level of physics that says that gravity is, uh, gravity is hydrodynamic entanglement. I think may, maybe Leonard Susskind might have said that. It's definitely a fluid metaphor, to be sure. Which means reality could be fluid. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Is nine an enneagram? Nine is the source of anywhere, anyhow, you know, anytime. It's definitely A-N-Y. So even though it's spelled E-N-N-E, -N -N -E, it goes back to this notion of A-N-Y, where it can be anything. And so it's related to the pure energy state prior to its fractionation into these uh, ones and eights, twos and sevens, threes and sixes, fours and fives, uh, and nine basically controls zero. So you can kind of see that in the multiplication table, where if you multiply nine times any other number, you know, it's going to give you a digital root or reduce to a nine, just simply means that nothing has changed, you know, which is why it controls zero. But, but it's a little bit different than zero in the, in the sense that, you know, from zero, you can divide zero into a plus one and a minus one. But when you divide a nine, then you get, you know, two positive values. One of the positive values, though, is, is the opposite pole, which behaves like a negative number. That, that's a little bit more complicated to see. So you're saying nine is any? Nine is any. 
which for me is a relationship to light or simultaneous. Yes. And yes. And then you mentioned that the integers or the fractions of nine, such as two and seven, one and eight, three and six, five and four, these are the, the fractions of the components of nine, which essentially to me looks like duality. Yes. Right. So we have this any light that separates into duality. And so that's how the numbers one through nine work. We've got nine is sort of the master of that. And then everything else is a fraction of nine. But what I would like a little bit more clarity from your perspective on is you're saying nine controls zero. What do you mean by that? Okay. Well, 20 years ago, I didn't even know that the term digital root existed. But a digital root system is what the traditional numerologists or astrologers have used, you know, for calculating birth dates and, you know, uh, destiny numbers and this kind of thing. So you're born on the 23rd and the tw 20, number 23 reduces to a 5 or the number 37 would reduce to a 10 and then a 1, right? This is a digital root. So whenever you uh, apply a digital root approach to nineness, it results in no change, no net change. So for example, if you have the number 8 and you add 9 to it, well then you've got 17. And 17 is the number, number 8 all over again. So it's just, you know, that nothing has changed in, in this use of 9. But you could do it with multiplication or division. You know, 9 has no effect upon what you started with. So it's similar to a zero. It's very similar to a zero, yeah. And this is stuff that the Hindus knew, that Buckminster Fuller, by the way, thought he was very innovative in discussing and analyzing in synergetics in his numerology section, uh, not knowing that the Hindus had a long tradition of exploring this stuff far better than him. But uh, he spoke of the octave integer system, you know, where there was this eightness of a plus four and a minus four, right? So that what you have effectively with the first four integers, one, two, three, and four, is followed by five, six, seven, and eight that behave like the negative forms of those first four, all right? And this is just, this is a part of, you know, the understanding of uh, some of the Hindu tradition and certainly an inherent part of the Midi property that is, you know, the prime reciprocal phenomenon or, or you know, key insight path. Uh, yeah, I should probably just say a little bit more because the plus four minus four, you know, system of integers could be modeled after interlacing tetrahedra that stabilize a cube. Could be. I mean, it's a nice model, right? Yeah, yeah, because two tetrahedra sit inside of a cube, right? Mm -hmm. And so they interlace in opposite directions, you know, in terms of their polarity. And so since a tetrahedron has four vertex points, if you were to put the first four numbers at those vertex points, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second set of four numbers, five, six, seven, and eight, at the vertices of, of another tetrahedra, then you could have them interlace, and then they could have these interesting types of polar relations, just like the MIDI property describes, you know, a 1 and an 8, or a 1 opposite an 8, a 2 opposite a 7, a 3 opposite a 6. And, and like I said, you know, this is just, you know, light mathematical philosophy that nobody would pay any attention to unless it had a proven use in a laboratory. As soon as that, that's, you know, a done deal, then, you know, the, the high levels of technology and corporate, uh, you know, funding are, are all over this stuff. So you mentioning the, the shapes and the numbers, it reminded me of a few days ago when you were at my house and we had a cube to Edrin furniture piece. Yes. And you were talking about it being the root polyo, polytope. Yes. Trouble you pronouncing. What is that? Yeah, 
yeah, the root polytope in terms of the cube octahedron is at the, is at the core, at the very center of the E8 lattice, which is, uh, which is, which is a Lie group you know, type of phenomenon that Garrett Lisi, probably the most famous uh, physicist surfer in the world, made use of when he wrote his paper, I think, back in 2006, called An Exceptionally Simple Theory of Everything. I think it was the most downloaded paper off the Cornell website uh, that year and, and got him, you know, the red carpet treatment up at the Perimeter Institute through uh, Lee Smolin, I think. But anyway, yeah, so the root polytope is, is key. And it was this Canadian uh, HS, HSM Coxeter, I think, who is Buckminster Fuller's hero, that wrote a lot about the role of the cube octahedron before Fuller made that the target of his own philosophical writings in Synergetics 1 and 2. Because among other things, well, it's an Archimedean solid that is very, very special in terms of closest packing, closest packing of spheres as opposed to the closest packing of circles, right? So that the cube octahedron is, in a sense, a three-dimensional representation of a hexagon, right? Because... Its 24 edges are effectively four interlacing hexagons. And in the same way that you can pack circles in the plane, you can pack spheres in three dimensions, and then they has this interesting kind of a field effect. But it's very, very, very special because you've got 12 spheres surrounding one so that the central sphere technically for a cube octahedron is the 13th sphere. And th there's... It, there's no other language other than base 10 that gives such a tribute to connecting the cube octahedron with the number 13 in terms of the oneness and the threeness that are in the number 13. Because at the center of a cube octahedron, you've got eight tetrahedra, all of whose fourth vertex points right, overlap in the center. So in other words, a cube octahedron has eight tetrahedra that nest inside its volume, and they all point from the outside in. The triangles are on the outside, and the fourth vertex is on the inside. And so you could in some sense think or believe that the Big Bang was a separation of those eight vertices that are all simultaneously overlapping in the center that get pulled apart you know, upon this deformation of the vacuum when the cube octahedron exits its Archimedean phase and moves into an icosahedral phase. And this was, you know, uh, what, um, what Coxeter wrote about. He's probably the most famous geometer of the last 500 years. And he was Buckminster Fuller's hero. So, yeah, to answer your question, the cube octahedron, it's, yeah, it's got its own cosmology that's so very rich. You know, you, you know, you could talk for hours just about it. I mean, Fuller wrote a thousand-page, you know, book about all of the implications of uh, the cube octahedron, the tetrahedra, and all these sorts of things. The cube octahedron has a rational tetrahedral volume of 20, which comes from the fact that, that the interstitial spaces, you know, or because the cube octahedron is not an all-space filler. It will not fill all space. But the half octahedra and tetrahedra that make it up will fill all space. And so when you calculate the volumes of, well, a unit tetrahedron and a half octahedron, the volume of a cube octahedron is 20. And when it collapses to an octahedron, which has a tetra volume of 4, it's effectively reduced its volume from 20 to 4 exactly five-fold while passing through five-fold symmetry, which is the icosahedron. So it, it's a whole language of you know, utterly fascinating potential that uh, I think Clee Irwin's group here in Los Angeles, you know, the quantum gravity research group, may be making use of. There's a lot there. The E8 lattice... Is that, does that mean eight dimensions? Is the E8 
relation? Is there a relation to dimensions? There, there, there is. And the, the truth is, because I'm not really, you know, a full-blown mathematician in the sense of understanding all the various aspects of, of dimensionality, because, uh, I mean, there, there can be hundreds of dimensions. And, and the truth is, because I believe in the power of language and the fact that the higher dimensions are not outside, they're inside. You can almost, in some sense, substitute the word diminution for the word dimension. You know, it's a form of reductionism. And when you project from a higher dimension, which has a higher density of connectedness, down to a lower dimension, the natural byproduct of that downward projection is a system of layers. So that layering is really the most interesting and simple way to explain dimensionality. And if you go with the basic tenet or, or premise that the, the fundamental distinction that universe makes is between inside and outside, then dimensionality and layers is everything in regard to that point of view. Not to mention just the dimensionality of the body, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, cells and tissues and organs and, you know, animals. Can we stay on that a little bit? So you're you're saying layers are the best way to explain dimensions and that higher dimensions, which I'm assuming you mean higher dimensions that we don't normally perceive yes. are actually inside as opposed to somewhere outside. Because in, in the consciousness, spiritually, spiritual community, there's these these essences of dimensions and, and interdimensional beings communicating with us, how does that relate in terms of layers of dimensions? Well, with, with regard to communication and, and just the design of uh, the cognitive field, it's, it's all about signal, signal strength. And... You know, as soon as you talk about signal, then you're talking about noise, you know, but uh, with regard to space, in terms of star systems and all this sort of thing, uh, the mystic spoke of veils, mm -hmm. and I interpreted that to mean some transition from a transparency into an opacity, you know, an opacity being you know, like the frosting on a shower door or something like that, because that's really what, in, in large-scale space, you know, the stars are opaque elements within the transparency. Of space. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're opaque elements. And, and this has been known since, like, the 1950s, you know, when John Archibald Wheeler wrote, you know, his famous book with Kip Thorne, you know, on gravitation. But... Uh, yeah, I think of dark matter as this transparent element that moves into a neutrino phase when it wants to become visible. And so neutrinos are this veil. You know, you, you were talking about, you know, neutrinos being related to astrology in some, some way. And I think that they probably are because they, they are ordering principles. I mean, they might be very, very sheer, uh, but they definitely control image space within star systems. There's no question about that. Uh, not that anybody would try to decrypt the neutrino mass mixing matrix and, and you know, bring it into the context of, of the DNA to try to make that, that connection with you know, biological design, but it's probably there to be had if anybody was persistent enough. So the higher dimensions are more transparent than the lower dimensions, which be on oh. more... Dance. Well, gosh, um, I, I don't know quite what to say about that other than the higher dimensions are characterized by a greater density of connectedness. Oh, so it's the opposite. Yeah, a greater density of connectedness. And so when you project down from a higher dimension to a lower dimension, it's kind of the way in which time is wound in a very tight spiral and the way in which it would, you know, disperse into a planar environment 
like the accretion disk of a galaxy. So time is, in a sense, a vertical orientation, you know, as opposed to the horizontal plane, which would be spatial. Okay, so it's, it's all lumped together at the higher dimensions where everything's touching at, where there's more oneness. Yes, there, there, there is more oneness. In, in fact, you can describe that exactly in this way, in terms of tangency. Six circles will touch a central circle, the one in the plane. Twelve spheres will touch oh, the, the central sphere in three dimensions. Twenty-four will touch a central sphere in four dimensions, then, then it goes up, I think, culminating ultimately in, in 24-dimensional space where you've got, you know, like a couple hundred thousand spheres that are all touching a central sphere. I think it might be called the leech lattice or something. So you got some papers that you've written here, right? And I want to go back to the, the magic squares. Yes. Because those come up in your papers. And how, could you explain what a magic square is and how the, the functionality of it yeah. You could call it a tool for divination, only in the sense that you can't talk about divination without talking about optimal distributions of things in terms of feng shui and this type of thing. But a magic square, as it was first uh, discovered or used in China by, uh, by either Emperor Yu or, or the sage Fu Si, H-S-I, uh, is these nine subsquares in which you put the nine integers, one through nine, in a certain array so that diagonally, horizontally, and vertically, they all sum to 15. Oh, so it's, so it's the same number. Is it always 15? Well, it's always 15 when you use the numbers one through nine. Now, if you substitute the, the prime reciprocal values or these values that were known to, we'll say, the MIDI property or the Vedic mathematics of the Ekadikina Pravina, which is a mouthful, but it's sort of like a formal, in, uh, formal essence or, or perspective in Vedic math, there, there ends up being a second solution to the magic square, which was only believed to have one solution because they're only looking at the numbers one through nine. But as soon as you substitute a zero in place of a nine, you know, and a one in place of an eight, and a two in place of a seven, and this sort of thing, then you get a magic square that adds to 12. And between those two solutions together, 15 and 12, this is how you get what is known as the formula for a magic square constant, the constant being 15 or 12, but the formula for a magic square constant being n to the third power, plus or minus n divided by 2. So that the magic square as it was originally conceived with the numbers 1 through 9 that sum to 15 can be arrived at as, well, where n is, you know, the number 3, right? 3 to the third plus 3 gives you 30 divided by 2 gives you 15, right? As opposed to, as opposed to, 3 to the third power minus 3, which is 24, divided by 2 gives you 12. Now, the fact that all of this stuff fits so perfectly within prime reciprocal languaging means that the Chinese really had in their possession what they called an oracle, you know, based on prime reciprocal logic and didn't know it because they only had half the system. They didn't have the 12 system. They only had the 15 system. This is half the story which is half the story, because when you put them together, you know, the most unbelievable things happen. I mean, you, you, can, you can break any code, any code. Okay, so the, the magic square at its base level is the 3 by 3 square, right? Yes. And I looked through some of your work, and I saw bigger squares that were more than 3 by 3. Yeah, yeah. In the case of the DNA, because you've got... 4 to the third power of codons, right? 4 to the third is 64. And this system or perspective of how to interpret the DNA codes, three letters or three nucleotides, 
three, the, first, the three positions uh, involves looking at the first two letters as the root of the three, as the root of the codon. So it's as if, you know, you were trying to spell the word cat, you know, and you could get the root essence of the word cat just from a C and an A together, right? So you're going to look at the C and the A in terms of what it means in terms of the cat or a D and an O in the context of understanding a dog. I mean, this is really just the way it works. And so when you grow the magic square from its three by three form into a four by four form, okay, you grow it by means of a principle that involves prime numbers, has to do with the way that prime numbers group together. And uh, trying to remember the name of the guy that pioneered this, this approach to proving th these relations. Uh, I'll think of it in a second, but uh, in any case, the 4x4 four four square enables 16 values, right? And so if you take those numbers and you convert them to binary form, you take these base 10 numbers that complete the magic square so that the 4x4 four four square sums to 30, okay? And you convert those 16 digits, 16 integer fields, to binary values. They will absolutely perfectly align the three relations that define all the codon possibilities. Because you've got the Watson and Crick pair, right, which is guanine and cytosine and adenine and thymine. And then you've got the purine, pyrimidine relations, you know, which is adenine and guanine and cytosine and thymine. Then you've got the third relationship that no one's ever heard of called rumors transformation, you know, which is cytosine and adenine and guanine and thymine. So th this is how the 4x4 four four magic square completely articulates these four relations as axial orientations just by taking the magic square and converting it into binary form. It's very beautiful, and then you can use that as leverage you know, to make other predictions. And, you know, I mean, leverage is what all these systems are about, you know, because you run these thought experiments. It's like, you know, what happens if I do this, you know, and then you get a positive outcome or something that gives you more leverage into to understanding the next phase of, of details. So you're talking about, you're talking about DNA and, and where we have DNA, where DNA is sort of coding our body and our physical yeah. Do you use this in your life? Like, is there is there applications that you would use this information on oh. a day-to-day -day life? Yes. Yeah. What are some of those? It, it, it helps me understand and appreciate that life is a movie, that we are actors on the stage, and that the script that we're reading from, even though we could alter our lines... The script that we're reading from is our genetic code, primarily, because, you know, a zebra has its stripes, and as much as a zebra might want to change its stripes, it's never going to get rid of its stripes. It can change other things. You know, it can make other decisions, other choices, but it can't remove its stripes. So this is an aspect of what would be called the phenotype, which is the, the appearance of things, and the appearance of things is, is not superficial because everything that a scientist wants in a laboratory environment involves an appearance. They want to see it, because seeing is believing. So in terms of how I look at the world, in terms of how the people that I meet, the circumstances that I find myself in, you know, when I'm standing online at Whole Foods Market or, you know, or, or wherever I am, I know that I'm there because I'm reading from my script. And the, the fascinating thing is, is that you know, it's referred to as the reading frame in bioinformatics. This is what it's called. It's called the reading frame. And the reading frame is, is three letters at a time because that's what a codon is. And so you string these three letters you know, together to make these sentences and words and paragraphs and chapters and all that, and then you have effectively you know, the genetic code. And the frequency or the rate of occurrence for all of the amino acids, for all of the species of you know, plants and animals, you know, have been mapped. I mean, not exhaustively, but, you know, if you want to know, you know, how many times a certain amino acid comes up in a zebra from this part of Africa, you know, it's known. 
you know, or, or a butterfly, or, or what separates the frequency of a certain amino acid profile, you know, of, of a butterfly from a plant. You know, you can compare these things. Uh, th these are known as codon frequencies. This is a, I don't really know even how to phrase this question, but you're mentioning the codon frequencies within DNA and that being the script for which we as actors are reading from yes. to generate our life experience. A part of our life experience is everything that's happening outside. And we mentioned the difference between outside and inside. And so when I look at the wall, I'm not necessarily, I'm not necessarily, well, there is a wall is made of wood. So there is DNA in there, but is there, there's not DNA in everything. Is there like, is our script that you're talking about is coding reality? Is it interacting with everything? I will tell you what I believe in this regard, which, you know, which the latest findings from the James Webb telescope is, is assisting with because the, the Big Bang being the most unlikely thing to have ever occurred, meaning, you know, that everything was compactified, you know, into, you know, this one singular point that suddenly, you know, exploded for no apparent reason. I mean, this makes it the most unlikely event to ever possibly occur, right? And, and it is like introducing deity. So it's sort of like saying, you know, uh, grant us this one, you know, free wish, you know, in the physics world, you know, and we'll give you everything else. Just grant us this one first free wish, you know, that we get to have the Big Bang and everything will follow. But if James Webb is correct or with, or, or that ekpyrotic theory, which is this, you know, theory of, you know, compression and expansion where things just, you know, go down to a seed and then they expand again. So it's like from the seed to a plant or a seed to a tree, you know, back and forth. It's more of a Hindu perspective, really. If that's true, and they have to throw out the Big Bang, then it's certainly possible that the Big Bang, pre that the genetic code preceded the Big Bang in terms of a form of logic that was inherent within a kind of a supernova intelligence, or that all of particle theory is, is co-mapped and sort of concomitantly entwined with with the DNA. I, I like the idea very much that the DNA could have preceded a Big Bang or, you know, or an ekpyrotic scenario that uh, I think was popularized by Paul Steinhardt at Princeton. I, I think that there's no other choice, you know, that they're going to have to give in to that eventually. And so our DNA is relating to everything else. It's not a, it's, we're not a separate, independent entity operating within a reality that responds to us. It's all, so you're, I think it sounds like it's all predetermined or at least. There, there's tremendous detail and precision in the ultimate miniaturization paradigm. You know, miniaturization is not an industry as we know it other than and we speak of nanotech, but it's all about miniaturization because the smaller the wave, the higher the frequency, the higher the frequency, the more the energy, and the higher definition, you see. So you get to see things with higher definition, the higher the frequencies are. The most fabulous, unanticipated thing about the DNA that I learned was this thing, this, this process known as disambiguation. And we all know what ambiguity is. Ambiguity is when things are vague. And the DNA has distinct aspects of ambiguity where a codon is unspecified in terms of its exactness. And so it can go into a phase of being either this or that, right? And you don't know which. Uh, so that in bioinformatics you can have, instead of, you know, cytosine, 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 as in CCC, which specifies proline, right? 
you could have Y, 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 which means pyrimidine, pyrimidine, pyrimidine. And what's a pyrimidine? Pyrimidine is either a C or a Y, or uh, I'm sorry, either a C or, or a T, it's either cytosine or thymine. So that means it can be one of two things. But you can use these, uh, these generalizations of purine and pyrimidine in place of the exactness. And this is what gives the genetic code flexibility. So that you can even go to a step further where you replace cytosine, uh, where you replace a pyrimidine or a purine with an N, which means it can be any one of four nucleotides, and you don't know which. And so to the degree that that would specify an anonymous state of anonymity, the DNA involves these gradations between what is anonymous and what has been identified. And it's quite fascinating because, I mean, you, you, you think about, you know, space in terms of not having an identity initially prior to a Big Bang or some birth sequence, and then all of a sudden, you know, over time, all of these identifiable features give it an identity. I mean, we could call it an ego or, or an awareness or any of these things with relate, that relate to personality and our understanding of self. But, yeah, I mean, the, the DNA is, is a fabulous study when it comes to this field known as disambiguation, where things are going from a state of a blur into being sharp, clearly defined. I do, I do hear you saying there is some flexibility in there for expression to go in multiple different ways. Yes. Okay. So not completely predetermined. There is there is options in some sort of way that I can't verbalize right now. Yeah, and, and me either, you know, other than, because I don't, I don't really know the, the nuances of ambiguous chemistry in terms of how things can be in these, you know, states of possibility, you know, unexpressed. But this is the stuff that, you know, genomic science is decrypting and getting to see clearer and clearer. I mean, they just need the right metaphors to run the right thought experiments and then, you know, discover these new things that are active. So there's two books here. One's called Numbers Microscope. What's the other book? Yeah, the other one is uh, The Wall Designer. And the, the Wall Designer was just this sort of tribute to my all-time favorite art because, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years that I've been, you know, going at the sciences and all of this stuff that requires high-precision high thinking that you have to be right about uh, that can be a little bit stressful. You know, I've retreated into appreciating art uh, and, and just, like, falling headlong into it so that uh, the way I laid this particular book out you know, it's kind of nice because you get to see smaller images that you could like, but then not really be able to see all the detail that's involved in the image until it was printed at six foot, you know, uh, you know, proportions. And then all the detail literally explodes from this little, from this smaller space. So that's been my, uh, been my, my fondest uh, sort of philosophical engagement with the arts, you know, that deals with resolution. And, and I didn't upgrade my Adobe programs until they introduced uh, Super Resolution as this new feature for, you know, bringing smaller files into larger, you know, uh, scalability. And that this book is a tribute to probably my, my all-time favorite 400 uh, commercial art posters from the 1950s in, in Europe and elsewhere, just dealing with everything from travel, transportation, you know, uh, sports, politics, uh, yeah, food, food and drink, beverages, all, all the stuff that needed to be advertised, you know, and, and draw consumers into wanting to, you know, buy in an age before there was television and certainly before internet. So they're mo so <laughs> I'm hearing perspective resolution and I'm thinking about numbers. And so there is an overlap 
between the science that you've spent your life consumed with and the art world. Yeah, there's, there's a, there's absolutely. There, there, there is a meeting point, you know, and the meeting point would be different for different people. Because, you know, if you're talking to a mathematical physicist, then, you know, it's some form of quantum geometry that's going to be that meeting point, you know. Uh, but, you know, in, in terms of art, in terms of the design of nature, you know, in, in a general kind of a blanket sense, uh, you know, the degree or, or the history to which the golden mean has been appreciated is, is right at the very heart of it all. Because the golden mean is absolutely 100% implicit in electroweak symmetry, which means that it's implicit in energy to matter transformation. It's it's the most fundamental thing, and to uh, to come to grips with the idea that this was identified as being so fundamental, you know, a thousand or two thousand years ago, when already they had trigonometry, you know, uh, is just nice to know because you get to revisit the fact that ancient wisdom, you know, it was a real deal. And it's just difficult to keep up with uh, in terms of not losing it because, you know, wisdom goes extinct. We can uncover it all we want. There still needs to be the people that can comprehend what we're looking at. Yeah. That's for, that's for somebody like you is useful. Is there any... Any um, any times in your life that you're like, I believe you mentioned one already. But is there is there anything that numbers or, or what we're talking about, looking at things in a comprehensive way? Is there any point where it shattered the paradigm that you had? can completely change maybe even the trajectory of your... Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I would say absolutely, sure. And there are very practical ways of going through life and then very abstract ways of going through life. And, you know, some people, you know, are, are off in the clouds, you know, and other people are very grounded. But... Um, I would say gosh, I, I just lost my thought. I, I had a really good one. Um give, give me a minute here to uh to reassemble it. Yeah, okay. It has to do with the distinction between the inanimate and the animate. Because in the matrix there's almost no distinction between the animate and the inanimate. And there have been times when I've been able to communicate with inanimate objects simply because they're in the matrix. And when I had this big breakthrough with the code in terms of translating the two magic square solutions into a magic rhombus, you know, which involved 216 digits, and I looked at the whole portrait you know, of these numerical arrays in terms of how they interacted like this absolutely beautiful machinery. I had such an intimate connection with my uh, digital clock that was in the bedroom that for about 24 hours while I was under this spell, I could see the clock in my mind's eye at all times. And if anybody had, like, looked at me, you know, watching me, you know, from, you know, from above terms of what's this guy doing? You know, he's sitting at a desk, but he keeps running in the bedroom. What is he, what is he running in the bedroom to do? It was to look at the clock because I wanted to completely, you know, confirm that I was seeing on the clock what, what I could see up here. And it only lasted for about 24 hours, but it made me think that the veil that, that, that connects or disconnects or separates uh, the inanimate and the animate is, is very small. Is very slight. And, you know, there's certain things that we need to wake up to in the same way that children are told about the birds and the bees when they're a certain age. 
but not before they're a certain age. Otherwise, it's not going to make any sense to them, right? You try to, you know, it, it's like a, a five-year-old is, is not likely to ask you where babies come from. Not likely. But if they did, you probably shouldn't tell them the truth, you know, or give them all the details because until their body is, is like, you know, ready for a certain level of maturity and explanation so that it really makes sense, you, you don't want to give them that knowledge. It's just going to confuse them. And, you know, uh, all of this is like another day of, it's like another first day of puberty. And so that's why, that's why there's occult practices, secret societies, or the stories of having to climb up a mountain for two weeks to see a guru at the top that gives you the wisdom. There's a certain level of, maturity that's necessary especially when you're talking about something like piercing the veil and perceiving through onto the other side there's a gate there and it's and it's there for a reason and so there a lot of this this like you you mentioned like i'm looking on this book and there's there's these shapes, and a lot of that is explained in cultures or traditions to the the, the people that are the, the high class of priests. Yes. And they went through many, many years of preparation yes. to get to this point. And a lot of it has to do with controlling your emotions, controlling your mindset, so that when you are given the codes that you're going that you're responsible for them. Yes. Yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, to reveal the secrets of the Pythagorean Brotherhood, you know, in Alexandria, Egypt, or, or wherever, you know, it was punishable by death. They took the knowledge so seriously that, you know, to, to betray the Brotherhood and to, to share a lot of this wisdom, you know, irresponsibly, yeah, there, there were harsh penalties. Uh, Buckminster Fuller in Synergetics talked about the priest mathematicians, and he thought that the reason why the number 13 was considered unlucky, because, you know, he was into just how powerful a number it was, he thought that it became unlucky because those that knew the wisdom of the number 13 didn't want others to know, and so they made it unlucky to keep people away from it. Yeah, but I was born on the 13th. It's always been my number. It's right at the center of things. Nice. Because it's the, the 13th sphere. Right? Yeah. Yeah, the number 13 is, is probably my favorite number. I mean, I could talk for the, about the number 13 for a whole hour. Because... Why don't you give us like two minutes on the number 13? <laughs> okay, two minutes on the number 13. Well, because we were talking about the cube octahedron in terms of its being a 12-sphere you know, tangent to one central nuclear sphere, where the nuclear sphere is the 13th sphere, okay, that has eight tetrahedra, all of which point in to the center, okay, such that the fourth vertex point of all these tetrahedra are overlapping, okay. Now, to know what happens in the Big Bang, since there are eight of these that are touching simultaneously at the center, you have to take the eighth root of 13. And this, this unleashes, you know, a tremendous amount of, uh, of symmetry and guidance for, uh, for the whole evolution of, of nature. It's absolutely remarkable. But in terms of the oneness and the threeness of a tetrahedron, right, because there's always going to be one vertex point opposite a face, a triangle, of three, so that no matter what uh, vertex point you touch of a tetrahedron, it's going to be opposite three. So that the journey from the center one of all, te all eight tetrahedra in the way that they constellate, okay, to the outside, to, to the radial, you know, uh, circumference or, or boundary of the cube octahedron is a journey from one to three, because it's the one point opening into a triangle. That's just undeniable. And so to the degree that that would be synonymous with Hindu tradition where they speak of 
the prakriti opening into the three gunas. This is it. And this is the 13 in terms of its oneness and its threeness. is a journey from one to three. And so only in base 10, you know, and under these types of description, descriptive terms, do you get to arrive at that source of wisdom? It only happens under that circumstance. You use a different base system or whatever, you know, and none of this mystery of 13 has that meaning of oneness and threeness. It's also the fact that you have the U1 electromagnetic symmetry in particle physics, and then you've got SU3, you know, which dictates the strong force. And just exactly what that connection is between the U1 and the SU3 is very mysterious since they don't have or they haven't successfully incorporated what's called grand unification, you know, of electroweak with the strong force. Uh, I happen to think it happens through, you know, SU5, you know, so it's all about the mysteries of five and prime number logic. But, uh, yeah, I, I know that this is implicit. The U1 and the SU3 is is dominated by 13-ness. The correct interpretation of, of how those forces uh, of particles interact is, is tied to 13-ness in just that way. Uh, you, you, you can also look at it this way. Is it because if you ask the question, what happened to the, to the 13-ness, what happened to its primality when its oneness and its threeness got separated, right? If you raise one to the sixth power and you subtract three to the sixth power, in other words, you've got the one of the 13 and the three of the 13, you separate them from 13, raise the parts to the sixth power, which is the period in one thirteenth, okay? And you get this value, 728, which is 13 times 56. And there just happen to be 56 baryons of which the proton and neutron, you know, that make up our existence here are, are two of the 50, are two of the 56. So you could argue that this oneness and threeness is restored through the 56 baryons that have been symmetry broken from this U1 and SU3 relationship. Uh, yeah, that, that's about all I, I should say now. Okay, well, hopefully you get to talk about this um, some more. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to, to this conversation? Yes. Uh, only that the actual formula for Higgs is Ashe Darwatker's formula, you know, which is two W bosons plus one Z divided by two equals H. And the value, the diphoton value that CERN arrived at in 2013, which was 126.8 GeVs, that's the real number, not the number that they're using now, you know, which is, you know, 125.2 or 0.3 or, or whatever, because it got statistically averaged, you know, by some of the other, you know, laboratory work that went on subsequent to it. And it, it's all about averages, you know, because no one's, looking at uh, at these idealized forms of, of predetermined, you know, mass spectrums, so that the 126.873 is the real Higgs number. You know, those are the extra two digits of accuracy. You know, 126.8 versus 126.873, because this is based on Mersenne prime number 127. And Mersenne Prime 127 has the most brilliant Fibonacci in intelligence. So this is, this is where it all goes to work, is through 127, which is Higgs' real value. So I could conclude with that. Uh, and so that could, be, that could lead to some advancements in the understanding of Higgs, then, right? It would, you know, and it would certainly put Ashe Darwadker on the map because, I mean, he's a known textbook writer in algebraic topology, but no one gave him any credit, really, for predicting the Higgs mass four or five years before they found it. So I mentioned your website, numbersmicroscope.com. Is there anywhere else somebody can reach out to you at? Or is this it? 
Yeah, yeah, num Numbers Microscope, JL at numbersmicroscope.com is, is the email, Jonathan Leaf. Uh, All right, we'll end it there. Thank you. Thank you.